1972, the Battle of Mirbat took place in Oman during the Dofar Rebellion, aided by communist guerrillas from South Yemen. As part of its assistance to the Omani government, the United Kingdom sent the Special Air Service SAS units to train troops and compete against the Popular Front for the liberation of the occupied Arabian Gulf for the Omani people. And during that event, nine British heroes entered Special Air Service's legend by fighting 400 bloodthirsty fanatics. Watch this video until the very end to know about the real action, the actual story. The two SAS men gazed out into the desert from the rooftop of the ancient mud building. They and seven colleagues had been under siege for six hours, frantically battling off an army of Arab insurrectionists bent on wiping them off the face of the planet. They were encircled and outnumbered by at least a factor of 25. Then, in the distance, they saw a V formation of soldiers approaching them. Their hearts sank. How many bullets do you have left? Corporal Bob Bennett asked gently of his colleague. Seventeen, responded Trooper Roger Cole. Bennett counted his bullets and nodded by saying that ah, less than a full magazine, meaning less than twenty shots. They would fight till the end, but they would not be captured alive. There was no compassion in desert conflicts like this one in the Gulf state of Oman in 1972. Two SAS troops apprehended in neighboring Yemen had their heads severed and put on spikes. Cole drew the remaining box of grenades from his bag. They tossed them at any rebels who attempted to break through the door, and if that didn't work, they'd kill themselves with their remaining bullets to prevent arrest. The Battle of Mirbat had reached a critical juncture. Memorable Operation Today, it is recognized as the most courageous operation the SAS has ever fought, although most people are unaware of it since it was part of a proxy war in which Britain had no official role. Cole, as we'll see, made it through the day uninjured. He chronicled the epic struggle in a book released in August 2011 and revealed how near the SAS came to death and defeat as they fought on their own against an army numbering in the hundreds. But, of course, they weren't there officially. The enigmatic men from Hereford were a shadow force that few people, even in their own nation, knew existed over 40 years ago. Even after decades, they were hailed as superheroes in the aftermath of the Iranian embassy siege in London. But, for the time being, their actions were shrouded in complete secrecy. A small covert detachment was sent by the Foreign Office and snuck into oil-rich Omar. Their aim was to keep this crucial region near the Gulf's entrance from coming into the hands of anti-government communist militants from the PFLO, or Popular Front for the Liberation of Omar. In theory, they were just consultants entrusted with bringing the pro-British Sultan's army up to speed. But in actuality, the British Army Training Team, as it was formerly known, served as his backbone and driving force. The problem was that the Red Guerrillas, trained and equipped by China and the Soviet Union, were triumphant. Moreover, they already controlled vast swathes of the rugged, mountainous, and mostly barren terrain. The reason behind this operation. The path to Muscat, the capital, would be open if they conquered Mirbat, a fishing village, and the Sultan's days would be shortened. The Cold War was at its pinnacle, with proxy wars happening all over the world. The communists would have their foot on the west's windpipe if they took control of the Straits of Hormuz, the canal beside Oman through which most of the free world's oil was delivered. The SAS's B Squadron nine-man squad would leave the next day to be replaced by G Squadron, already in Oman and prepared to take over at an air station 40 miles away. The morning twists. They slept well that night ignoring the fact that highly armed rebel soldiers were massing outside along dried-up riverbeds, ready for assault. 
They were awakened by the sound of the first mortar shell shortly before dawn. Cole had rolled out of bed and was on the roof, hidden behind six layers of sandbags firing his machine gun. It was a drizzly, cold morning with a dense, whirling mist that he couldn't see through. However, he was awakened by noises of hostile activity in the desert. He poured margarine into a tin and smeared it all over the ammo belt. By keeping the weapon oiled and shooting, the margarine would save his life that day. Only 500 yards away, the first assailants emerged from the darkness. He pressed the trigger after setting the rifle to continuous firing. The Battle of Mirbat had begun. With Kalashnikovs, mortars, and rocket-propelled grenades, the assailants were well equipped. Large machine guns were stationed on slopes overlooking Mirbat's approach. Unfortunately, the SAS could only manage a World War II-era 25-pounder cannon and a Browning anti-aircraft gun that could only fire two rounds at a time. Captain Mike Keeley, the soldier's leader, carried a handgun, and each soldier had a rifle, and that was the end of it. They should have been quickly overtaken and wiped out. They did, however, put up a strong fight. Cole fired bursts of rounds from the roof and witnessed enemy troops fall as the rebels launched a full-scale head-on attack at the outer barrier. To be sure, he swept the corpses with bullets once more. Bennett ran beside him, seeing enemy positions and giving orders to one of the squadron's two Fijians, Tak Takavisi, and two other soldiers operating the mortar pit below. The second Fijian, Corporal Talaisi Labalaba, known as Laba, a monster of a man, commanded the 25-pounder half a mile away on the opposite side of the defensive circle. He slid low-level rounds at the enemy as they wormed their way towards the barbed wire boundary, crouching beneath its metal screen. This was a gun that could shoot over a seven-mile range. It was aimed and used at close range, almost as if it were a rifle. It was usually crewed by four people, not just one. Both sides recognized the importance of the huge cannon in the defense of Mirbat. With their mortars, the rebels constantly attacked them. If the enemy gets the cannon, we're completely screwed, Cole grumbled to himself. The weapon suddenly fell quiet after a particularly brutal hammering. This was the moment they had all been waiting for. Tack, worried about his closest friend Laba, took action. As bullets exploded around him, he sprang up and dashed straight to the gun pit, ducking and dodging over the desert floor. Then, with mortar rounds falling down all around him, he dived in. He discovered his fellow Fijian in a horrific situation, a bullet having ripped his jaw to bits. But the corporal was still functional, and the two of them rapidly reactivated the weapon and held off the invaders. The bravery of Officer Keeley. But the weapon was only reactivated for a short time. Tack stumbled back after being struck by enemy gunfire. Mirbat's defense seemed to be finished. Then came the moment of extreme courage, which turned Commanding Officer Keeley, a young officer in his mid-twenties on his first assignment to the elite team, into an SAS legend. But first, someone has to make it to the gun pit and reactivate the weapon. Tack was fortunate in that his sprint caught the assailants off guard but they'd have to wait now. There was little probability of making it a second time. Keeley was a studious-looking guy with wireframe spectacles and the demeanor of a Latin teacher from a public school. He did, however, have steely nerves. Then he took off his flip-flops he'd been wearing and slid into his desert boots. He was going on his own. There was no debate. They all agreed to accompany him. Tommy Tobin, one of the platoon's specialized medics, was chosen by the captain and the two of them proceeded to the gun pit. They were targeted by every rebel rifle and mortar. They moved over the desert floor, shooting first, then advancing and protecting each other. Bullets flew past their heads or rebounded off the rocks, slamming into their pounding legs and chests. Yet against all odds, they succeeded. The sight when they arrived at their fallen friends was one of pure horror. 
The gun floor pits were littered with empty shell casings stained with blood. Laba was no longer alive. Tack was still alive, propped up at the edge of the hole and shooting his weapon to keep the attackers at bay, who were now just yards away. With his gun, Keeley joined him at the barrier, calmly dispatching any rebels who came into view. Keeley was convinced his dying moment had arrived when a grenade dropped at his feet, but miraculously it failed to detonate. Their good fortune, however, was not to endure. Tobin's skull was broken by a rebel bullet. More slammed into his back and shoulder. He was still alive, but his and the platoon's time was running out. How much longer were they going to be able to hold out? The sky let forth a sigh of relief. Two Omani Air Force jet assault aircraft piloted by freelance British pilots had finally broken through the low overcast clouds that had previously prevented air operations. When the plane screamed in low cannons blazing, the rebels were only minutes away from capturing the gun pit. They held down the rebels for 30 minutes before having to flee. This was the opportunity for the rebel leader and he gathered his troops. Hundreds of them made their way back to the gun pit. The ending. Fuzz, the tube, was picked up by Hussey, the platoon's top mortarman. He didn't have any bearings or coordinates to work on. He used his eyes to line up the target. The rebels were scattered as the mortar sailed through the early air and landed 30 yards from the gun pit. It was a miraculous shot that bought valuable time, but it wasn't over yet. A hundred rebels dead were spread over the desert, but the others prepared for the last attack. Cole was up on his rooftop and noticed the V formation approaching in the distance and feared the worst. He was utterly incorrect. It was a relief column as more enemy troops and G squadron had arrived. The heavy cloud that had kept their helicopters grounded until a break in the weather enabled them to go through. The fight was swung by their arrival. The insurgents fled. They had been defeated just when triumph seemed to be within their grasp, courtesy of the magnificent Nine of the SAS. It was a critical juncture in the conflict. The Sultan's army gradually gained the upper hand and gradually repressed and evicted the communists from Oman. The SAS held a private memorial service for Lava and Tobin, who died of his wounds back in England. There was little public applause or even knowledge of the situation. If we weren't meant to be waging war there, how could there be? But behind the scenes, official gratitude was discreetly expressed. Keeley received a DSO, but his soldiers believed he deserved a Victoria Cross. That's all for today's video. If you're visiting this channel for the first time, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe so that you never miss an exciting upload from us.